So, so I have a lot of uh, slides, but I would like to have this more like an interactive session and we are a, an association across the world. So please, this is just one iteration and I hope that there can be a lot of iterations with the with the team. So, so I would like to, to map at least three expectations from the participants and uh, if you can tell in, in Dutch it's, it's okay too just to see that we cover some of the expectations that the audience have and um, please uh, can somebody take the use uh, the notes to have some expectations yeah we will do so yeah we don't have any reactions yet Ipona. Um, as soon as they will uh, arrive, we will let you know. Okay. So should we continue, Frank? I don't see any. Yeah. OK, uh, Frank can let me know if there are coming some expectations. As a preparation, what we thought is that the participants will be familiar with the different understandings of resilience and specific concepts and practices. So we will be linking the concepts to the practices. So first, as I mentioned, we have some stories and premises why we need to talk with, res with resilience at the safety management or at society level. And then we will jump between what is a concept and a, a practical a method or, or a strategy or intervention. So, so hope they give you a lot of energy to talk about resilience. But why we are talking about resilience and we started starting this work around myself I around 2006, Holnagel uh, Woods and then around 2003. And uh, it started also one of the examples is the um, Colombia accident when it was a lot of uh, pressure, production pressure and decisions and the, the focus was to be faster, better and cheaper. And then it was a sacrifice with safety. So that's when it talks about the need for resilience. And at society level, we see we have a lot of interdependencies. Now, critical infrastructures, we are all dependent on digitalization, as an example that we are living now. There is a lot of uh, energy is dependent on ICT, communication. So, so we need to have a society that is prepared to manage surprises and cascade effects. And when we talk about disasters, we have uh, disasters that can happen very slowly or things that are happen very sudden. And we have these society changes. We have uh, people, migration, globalization. And what we see now is that the, at the society level and also an organizational level for uh, aviation, for example, we have a lot of uh, risk analysis that uh, is about understanding current risk, hazards and threats, doing a risk analysis and identify the defenses. So then we build a fortress and we produce plans and we train to test procedures for expected events. And one of the aspects of resilience is to how we will deal with unexpected events because we cannot be prepared for everything. We have limited resources. Trying to put. But why now? What? Why this impera imperative to to work with resilience? And we see as a society we are living in a digital transformation. All the way of working is changing for all of us. We are experiencing experiencing wildfires. Like the examples, it was like the one that occurred in Sweden, in the States, or in Portugal last year. We have also the Fukushima Daiichi, and we all are affected by the COVID-19 that is affecting our society in an unprecedented ways. But at the same time, we are seeing how the, the, the society reorganized and the opportunities for innovation. And this is an example that I have in the middle is how 
a company in Norway that is uh, normally produce sails for sail boats changed their production to produce protecting gears and using existing resources to reorganize and support activities in this crisis. So we see also a link between resilience and innovation, how, how we can find new ways to cope with unexpected things. So I am sure that there are a lot of examples also in your country or in your organization, how people is adapting to cope. Do you have any comments or questions or expectations? Uh, Frank has arrived some comments. Frank, have you identified some comments? Okay. Uh, Ivonne? Yes. Uh, well, the most important question, of course, is if we share the presentations afterwards, but that's definitely a yes. Um, yes. And Bettina is asking Ivonne, what's the pr best practice according to you? Okay, yeah, we will, we will, um, one of, of the things is that, that one of the things that is characteristic of resilience and as uh, I'm saying here is that we are looking a lot of events that are happening, but also looking in the sources of resilience that exist in the organization, because the, the, the important thing is that we are resilient. We adapt the organizations, people and the society as a whole has to adapt in different ways because we don't have 100 percent of information as the COVID. We have to adapt that things change. So, so the idea is to look at this. What are the, the, the sources of resilience, how to adapt, looking not only on the things that can go wrong, but also looking into the things that go right right now and learning from that. So, so that's that's uh, that's one of the main things that are coming from from resilience engineering. Broaden the scope, not to look only on things that go wrong, but also looking into the things that go right. Could be a good uh, answer. Yeah, I, I think that's a correct answer, a good answer. Um, and most other um, questions or remarks are mostly that people want to get a better general idea about resilience or better insights, etc. Uh, and what it really means in the field. So I think it's that is also part of the next part of your uh, presentation. Um, so I would say just continue and then all answers will be uh, questions will be answered. So, so I just have to highlight that the, not all we don't have all the knowledge. This is a, a, a exploration that we are doing. So, so this is also an invitation that we work in this area. It's not a very old uh, perspective. So, but we can I can try to show you some of the things that have been done. So, so there is a confusion around the world and, uh, and not agreement about what is resilience. It was uh, an European project that ran for three years. In that part, in this European project, they were analyzed like 400 different journals and there were around 300, as you see, different definitions of resilience. So some talk about the stability, how the they own organization adapt. It's an act like capability that exists in the organization is a property, but the main concept on resilience is not something that the organization has, but how the organization, what what is the an organization and a system, what it does. It's not something that it has. So, so there, but there is still a lot of differences and the lesson learned from that is that uh, when you are working with that, maybe it's a good clarification in your team, how you understand and how you handle resilience. So as I, as I mentioned, this um, 300 definition, it means that it's an, a term that is super popular and not, it's not like it's a new term. It has been used a lot of in ecology as in the same first bullet that the ability to ab absorb and change. And then it has been also adapted for crisis management. When, as you see in, in the crisis management, in the second bullet, it talks about the ability of a system, a community, a society export to has exposed to hazards to resist, absorb, accommodate and adapt. And the problem with this definition is that is a mixture of resilience and risk analysis. 
because in risk analysis is also how you resist, how you build these barriers. So it's natural that there is a confusion. In disaster resilience, they are talking about the ability to bounce back after a crisis. And, and in city resilience, they talk about the abilities that the strength preparedness. So they focus on a different aspects that either a society on, or an organization has. And as I mentioned before, um, and this is based on work by Professor David Woods, that's the, all the links of this is at the end of the presentation, is that there are diverse understandings of resilience and also sometimes overlapping with the understanding with the risk analysis. So it's about some has the idea to rebound and recover or maintain a stable state. And this is very much related to the, activi to the activities that they are done on the risk analysis and risk management. While in resilience engineering, that is one perspective within resilience, there is a lot of focus on how to sustain this adaptive capacity that the organization has. And even when you are in your extremes of operations, how do you extend this adaptive capacity? And we will elaborate a little bit more on that. So here, is, uh, uh, this is an example of books and publications that have been done uh, with the pe people working within resilience. Some of them are open, some of them are we need to buy, but the point is that uh, at your left side, it was when I start a small group and it's the first book on resilience engineering. And then uh, last year it was uh, people around the world in different critical infrastructures trying to implement resilience and to further elaborate on resilience and resilience engineering. So, so this is the idea that within resilience engineering also the understanding of resilience how changed. So in the first book, when it was in 2004, I think, it was focused on the ability to keep and recover to stable state during of after major mishap. If you remember in the first slide, I talk about um, Colombia accident and it was major accidents and this pressure and trade-offs and the limited resources. So that was the, the focus then. Then in 2005, it was OK, now resilience is getting hyper popular. And then we have different these different four on the stack. And then the last one is the one that we are currently using is the ability a system or a society is uh, resilient or our organization if it can adjust prior, during or following events. And it looks at changes, disturbances and opportunities. And the focus is how to sustain the essential services or the essential function in the system. So how we can keep that. So as you can see, it has been a little evolution on the understanding within this community. So it's a perspective. So as I mentioned, is the ability to a system to adjust and it looks at changes, disturbances and opportunities. So that's the idea. So what characterizes resilience? So, so we don't need to manage resilience for systems that they are pure mechanical. We need to use resilience when we are talking to this increased complexity that we have nowadays, the interdependencies, when uh, it pays attention for everyday work and not crisis domains, and also how decisions are done across levels in the system, in the organization and it challenged the linear approaches that we have in risk management because it's not possible to, to identify all the elements and all the interactions, but, but this perspective advocates to the ability to be flexible and adapt. So have the capability to for its side anticipate and adapt because it's not possible to know everything in detail and we have limited uh, resources. So, do you have any comments or questions? This is about resilience, and then we will move to the practices. I don't know if you have some reflections around this. Uh, 
resilience and business continuity? Yes, it's very much related resilience and business continuity. And they are work on that because the idea is how you continue operations. So, so they are in relation on, on, on these two. So it would be very interesting to see how the one enrich the other one. Okay, and, and for you there, there is a big relation between the two, the two uh, let's say, um, uh, topics. Yes, maybe the one can inspire the other and, and so on. Yes, correct. Okay, thank you. And another question is what to expect from the ninth REA symposium in 2021? So, so I we expect first that we can go personal, that we can have a, a people attending and uh, that we can share a lot of uh, uh, applications on resilience across domains, uh, share experiences and learn from each other. So, so, so have the balance and not uh, not only theory, but also a lot of a lot of experiences. Maybe you can share when you are going there as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we will definitely share when we're going there and uh, what we're going to contribute, of course. Okay. So now we will go. Sorry. No, it's okay. Go on with your presentation. Please. Yes, I'm following the timing. So um, as I said, I, we don't need to cover all the slides, but we can, if you have questions afterwards, just uh, send it. And, and the idea is to cover a few things, but good coverage, then and rush on all the slides. So we will go through some uh, concepts and some methods and some practices. So we are going back and forward. So, so let's start with the, uh, from theory to practice. So here are some just some examples. And the idea on this slide is that they are to show you that there are some initiatives to apply these methods in different industries and also in different countries. And, and, and there are also, I, I'm just looking here, I forgot Af uh, Australia and other things, but the idea here is also that we help each other as a community of, pra of practitioners. So let's go for, for these concepts. One concept on, on complexity and, and the systems that we are dealing with, they are this that the results of uh, and the performance is not additive. The performance of the system is emergent. So even an example we have today, even if we have the presentation and we did the test and we do all the followings, the performance is how things come together and how the different parts of the system interact and it doesn't necessarily need to be in a linear way. So, so and then we have emergence and this is combined also with trade-offs and trade-offs. Here is an example from Eddie's Colonel book, Efficiency Thoroughness Trade-offs, but there are other trade-offs like um, optimally fragility, safety and economy, that also they come from uh, Woods and Robert Hoffman. They, the reference are at the end of the presentation. But the point of, uh, of trade-offs is that we have limited resources in terms of time, in terms of knowledge, in terms of money. So, so they are always a compromise, what we do. It's like a marriage, it's always a compromise. So, so <laughs> nobody is completely happy, but we can function together. So, so the idea is um, how you can balance this. One example is the efficiency thoroughness trade-offs. If we are very efficiency, efficient, maybe we are not too thorough and maybe we forget things. And the second is like optimal fragility trade-offs. If we have a lot of optimization in the system, a lot of good performance, how much do we have for for our spare parts and so on, then maybe we can be a little bit brittle and not continue operation. Another is like the bounds of perspective. So if we just look with the resilience perspective, we will look only adaptations and flexibility. But if we look with another perspective, like the risk, risk perspective, then you look in the various and defense. So the idea is that we are aware of the of the trade-offs that exist in the in the organization. 
An example that we have from aviation, it was that uh, in the north, when you need to land in the winter time, you need to have uh, sufficient lighting to land an aircraft. And uh, in this particular occasion, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the pilot said, OK, we can do a direct landing. And then you will save uh, fuel. But then when it hit the, the airplane was approaching, then it was not sufficient lighting. So then it has to do around that it will be then it will be more uh, fuel that was used. So because the airline want to be efficient, then they have to sacrifice and do an extra round to have this lighting to do the appropriate landing. So so and then it was that discussion is always OK, this was a trade off, was a good decision or not and so on. But the point is to bring these trade offs in, in, in light of the operations. So so we have this uh, resilience and, and uh, risk and resilience management. And, and we have we advocate that um, when we talk about uh, risk management in your left side, we talk about command and control learning from historical events, building scenarios and test procedures. And when we are looking into with resilience management, we compensate that with the ability to create and maintain and facilitate and how we can create people that have sufficient imagination, sufficient knowledge of the system to be flexible and cope with, with things that are not expected. How we can build organization that is looking forward rather to look into a specific scenario, looking into capacity building and network building. And the idea of network is that maybe you can borrow resources from other parts of the organization when something is happening. And in co uh, to complement this train to test plan and procedures, looking into training leadership and network coordination. And this is because now, nowadays there are so many organizations that might be involved uh, to handle a situation. So for this one, it was uh, uh, the European project that I mentioned before. They work with uh, how to operationalize resilience management. And then it was, uh, and in this project, they have done different capability cards. And it was uh, a capability card. There are, the idea of this resilience management is not to, to, to do on top what exists, but the idea is to look what exists in organizations, how organizations manage safety, but with the glasses from resilience engineering. So we might do questions on what are the trade-offs, what are the interactions that exist, and so on. So here is an example. Uh, there is one of the cards that was developed that then that the, there is an European team, and here is the link that identify sources of resilience. So they propose different triggering questions and to address goal trade-offs. So one triggering question is during the management of everyday operations, are the different goals that may come in conflict, how operators succeed in meeting these goals and have a conversation around this. This is just an example. So, so there are questions that allow organization to revise their own way of working. So that's an example. Do you have an experience that you would like to share with respect of trade-offs or management of trade-offs? No, not, at, not at this moment, uh, Ivona. We don't have any experience to share, not yet, because we're not in contact with all the people that are surrounding us. There are a few questions, however. Yeah. One of the questions is, can you highlight team resilience? It's always a question if you talk about resilience, then it's a nice theoretical concept. But how do you how do you create it in a team? What do you need to 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 emphasize there? And, and is there a possible way to 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 start it? Yes, so first of all, I would say that our colleagues from the Netherlands and Jan Martin Skagen and people from TNO have worked a lot with team resilience. So this is a little bit outside my, my scope of uh, uh, knowledge. So, so I will refer to him. But in my experience is that uh, 
as you see, we just have a little piece of information on how we empower system, uh, empower people and involve people in solving the situation at hand. And it, this comes hand to hand with high reliability organizations that talk about deference to expertise. So sometimes you need to reorganize the organization to the real person who has the knowledge or the team that has the knowledge to have this, this empowerment in this ability to, co to work together. So, so, so this, um, this I, will, I will recommend to talk with Jan Mountain Skragen on this topic. Hope that I did the an answer. Okay, on that thank point. you. Yeah, there's one yeah. Mentimeter question. Um, we're going to publish it. Let's see. For all, I do it in Dutch. For all aanwezigen even Mentimeter, yeah. kun je weer even een uh, vraag beantwoorden. I, I asked in Dutch, uh, we have a, a computer system where people can see questions in their uh, mobile phone and they can answer them. Then we know how they respond. So if all okay. the people go back to menti.com and answer the question that's on your screen then we can ask the question to Ivona afterwards and the vraag die gesteld is is in hoeverre zijn door Ivona genoemde voorwaarden voor resilience aanwezig in de organisatie waar jij aan het werk bent zijn die er zijn die herkenbaar of zijn die helemaal niet herkenbaar Dus eigenlijk ook een beetje om een beeld te krijgen van de organisaties waar uh, alle luisteraars nu werken. Um, of ze zelf vinden dat ze voorbereid zijn. Uh, for Yvonne in English, we asked all the participants whether their organizations, whether the, 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 um, are resilient, is resilient something that exists in your organization? And are the, the terms and conditions that you mentioned, do they see them in their own organization or not? And I don't know whether you see it on the presentation, the, the outcome of Mentimeter. No, I'm sorry. We, I no, cannot sorry. see okay. that. Well, it's, it's a little bit in the middle. More or less is uh, the biggest group says more or less um, their organization um, fulfills the consequences that you stated that you need to have resilience in your organization. Okay. Okay. Is, yes, you can continue. Is there something you want to, uh, okay. to say? No. Uh, sorry. So, so, so one of, of, of our main concepts, another key concept within resilience is this uh, difference between safety one and safety two. And I'm sure many of you have heard on this and safety one that we focus on, on what is what what goes wrong so there is an argument that we look at safety by the lack of safety seeing how many accidents incidents we have so so it's uh, looking in what goes wrong while safety too focus on the ability to succeed on the varying conditions and that's what i think that business continuity will bring also that an add-on to this so the emphasis to see what works well what makes the organization work well in terms of resources, knowledge, organization, and put these conditions because these conditions uh, will emphasize when uh, when things are going outside uh, the the design envelope. So how you can adjust and so on. So so learning how the organization is already resilient in some way. So we have an example here and it's from healthcare because when Kes invited me, he mentioned there were a lot of people working from healthcare. And there is a, this is a, a, a little tool and it has been implemented first in Sweden. So, and then it was in fi five hospitals, I think in different centers in, in, Os in Oslo. So, and then it's, how to learn from work that goes well. So, so the idea on this uh, repeat tool, it was a, 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 a little uh, calendar that was created with questions to reflect, okay, 
what we did well today, what contributed to do well. And as you see, one of these, the questions are, are not used and so on, but the important is the discussion that they are having. And different organizations have adapted in different ways uh, these uh, tools. Some are implemented within uh, something that is called Green Cross in, in Norway and Sweden, but some organizations implement it as a separate uh, thing. So, so they are how people recognize changes, discuss how they manage surprises and so on. So there is a here in this presentation is a link from experiences from healthcare personnel in Sweden. I, I apologize because this is in Swedish, but maybe some of you will understand. Uh, there is a Norwegian experience in a blog that from the Resilience Association and Holnagel uh, with the people from the from Sweden. They wrote an article on how you you work with this. So, so it's not very costly way of doing, but it's a complement of what is done. So, so that's one one of the examples that we have. There, this kind of uh, of um, reflections have been also implemented by by Elizabeth Lay in the energy, more reflecting on surprises. What did surprise us today, and how well we handled this? So the idea is to complement uh, these uh, questions. Do you have any experience to share concerning what looking at what goes well? Uh, given the time, Yvonne, I think it's better to proceed now and to do some questions at the end. Um, yeah. We have like 10 minutes left, so I would say just uh, continue. Yeah. I think the idea here, we have a lot of, uh, of, of, of different methods, but then maybe I will leave the door open. So in the, in the presentation, we have concepts and then the concepts, we have different methods. And here's the example that I mentioned from the after action review, how we manage surprises. So, so this is also to complement the after action review that organization does. So when things go very well, so there are some examples here. So what I, I would like to say here is that uh, from Sidney Decker, he does, he did um, an article on resilience engineering and it's not all the solutions. So so the idea we have to 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 pay attention on, on, on resilience and also the not giving all the responsibility to the people on the floor, but also the organization has some responsibility. So facilitating the conditions for resilient operations. So I will go through the conclusions to ask for questions. So what we have seen in resilience from the 15 years is a lot of methods looking into observations. So that data, data gathering, looking into everyday operations. So observations, workarounds, and with questions from the resilience perspective. There are methods also concerning the analysis, the FRAM, the RAC, and so on. And the results, what is the added value? So it, it has helped to understand everyday work and the reconciliation of work as imagined as the designers and work as done in the reality. It has been a um, uh, use for design, recommendations for design. And in crisis management, uh, when it was a, a fire in the in Sweden, they used these resilience concepts when you were limited of resources and how you reorganize resources and borrow more resources from Norway. So it has been used also in terms of uh, crisis management. Resilience is about supporting the ability to adapt and continue operations. And these concepts provide ways to look to understand resilient systems and improving the design and operations. And trade-offs is an important part and complexity and so on. But the important thing is that the concepts need to be operationalized to a specific concept, a specific context. It cannot be just take it and apply, but it's really related to the specific context of the organization. And there are different ways to go to resilience, so from respond to learn, to monitor and adapt and so on. So I would like to invite you to the association. There are a lot of resources and videos 
and a lot of material that is available and we have webinars and all the material to to share and, and hope to learn from you as well. So I went a little bit quick towards the end, but it's to allow some questions. I think that is something two o'clock that I have time and here are the readings and so on. OK, Yvonne, I, I think uh, the next questions we will collect and we will gather and we will send it to you and we will publish them afterwards. And okay. the, the, we will also make uh, um, available all the tools that you mentioned on the on the area side, like the, the, the resilience performance enhancement toolkit and the after action review. We will uh, um, give the addresses to people so they can find the information. And afterwards we contact you and then we uh, will publish your answers on the let's say the 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 the, the whole samovating what's the samovating in english um summary the summary okay yeah uh, yeah okay um is there something you would like to 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 say to end your presentation that you would like to uh, to give to the people who are listening at this moment something they should do or some 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 idea so so my hope is that this uh, in, uh, put your curiosity to see how you can apply this, that you found some of these topics relevant yeah. and, and, yeah. and then that we can learn from each other when we are in this journey to the application of these ideas in practice that will help to more uh, progress in this area. Yeah, so we make a connection and uh, we share experiences and we build a connection between, let's say, the experience that we do here with what you do. Uh, I saw a finger here. You, you want? There's a question in there. Okay, sorry. There's a question in the in the chat. Uh, uh, is it working? Yeah, I'm one of the other speakers, so I have a little bit of an advantage here that I can ask you a question with a microphone. Thank you so much for a very interesting presentation. And I was wondering, in the beginning, you mentioned Slack, um, Slack resources. Uh, in in Dutch, we would call it a uh, buffer uh, to have some extra uh, resources, especially now with Corona, COVID, we've noticed that you need some extra uh, mouth uh, protection in uh, in your archives. But um, how do you uh, research that? Is there sort of a way to estimate how much slack an organization needs to adapt? So, so there are two words uh, uh, that come to my mind on Slack. And uh, 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 Tarsisa Saurin, he, he made uh, guidelines to cope to complexity and how you design a Slack in the organizations, how you build the Slack, because that's what it will help you to cope with situations. And, and, and if it's not there, I can send the, the link. And I'm sure that I can send the presentation from the, uh, and, uh, and, a paper from Tarsicio. They are working in the construction site and in healthcare with the Slack, with the concept of Slack and how you build that. And another way is to use these triggering questions to start gathering what is the Slack that is, exists across the organization. Because, uh, because uh, of the limited resources, this is Slack that you can move Slack across the organization will help you and, and reorganize that. So, so Tarsicio did this uh, with respect to complexity. Is that okay for you? I can share that uh, that uh, that the six guidelines for from Tarsicio. Was yeah. okay. Yeah. Yes, that's that's okay. Thank you very much. That would be very helpful if you would share that with us, and we will share with you all the comments that we receive, and we will send it to you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, hope Thank to you. see you. Hope to see you next time at the REA convention and in between with all the sharing of information and experiences. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you very thank much you very for much. the invitation. Bye bye. Okay.